started out with when we first moved to the property. Um, again, so coming to this property to do this was never a plan. Doing what we're doing now, it's just kind of evolved into that. And we started growing food here just for ourselves and thought it was pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, the food tasted awesome too. And so it's evolved from this little garden area, which was probably a quarter of what's here right now. It just kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, and so we've got a couple of runs way down the very far end of garlic, which is basically just for us and a bit of seed garlic so that we can start trying to do it on bigger scale. But we've always tried to run before we could walk and we've just always had unsuccessful garlic harvests. We're overrun with weeds, the too wet, too dry, whatever the issue is. So we're doing it on a smaller scale that we know we can handle. And as we master each one, we just start to make it a little bit bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So this is mostly where all of our lettuce is done. With the exception, there's a few other kind of random things, like there's a bit of celery we're trying. Parsley, parsley will be in here till, I don't know, next year probably if we wanted to leave it. Um, our turnips are in here and we've got three beds of carrots that we wanted to try and get in here as a little bit of a trial for a really, really early planting uh, and seeing how it's working for us. So it doesn't seem to be working too bad, but they're not quite up to size yet. So they still got some time. And so we don't have, um, uh, carrot rust fly but what we do have which I can look for if I can find him because I know he's here is a wire worm which I'm not finding him he would have been right on the surface no so so this mark right here on the carrot um. is from a wire worm and the wireworm is the larvae state of a click beetle, oh, which I, somebody told me this or I read this. My understanding is that there's 200 types or species, maybe, whatever it is, of click beetle and they're native to here. So it's not like we're going to be getting rid of these things anytime soon. They prefer grass and we have grass growing right next to this, so maybe they migrate over, um, but they don't live in the carrot where um, they just live in the soil and they'll eat it. So as unappealing as it is, you can get rid of that and still eat this and it'll still be very tasty. Um, the carrot rust fly, which is what the netting is for, is to stop the fly landing on the top of the foliage, laying the egg. The egg crawls down into the soil and then starts to live and eat inside here and you get a little maggot living inside the carrot. And we've been to places where we've seen carrots being sold that have rust fly in them. And I think it's absolutely disgusting. But uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's happening. But I would have thought people would pay more attention to that. I mean, that would be more acceptable. Not that we would sell that, but I could see someone trying to sell that more so than having a critter still living in there. Good one. These are still a little early. The germination on this is really poor. So again, there's huge gaps. That's all loss of revenue. And we won't even know that that isn't happening until two to three weeks after they've been planted to realize that they're not germinating or coming up. Or sometimes you might see some germinate and nothing there. And it's like, well, maybe the seeds there got a little deeper mm -hmm. or maybe they're a little slower. And then you notice they just never come up. Well, now we're four weeks or five weeks past the germination or the planting date. Hmm. You, you, you can't go back and replant. So we'll get what we get out of this. It was a good little trial. Um, and then we'll see what we find out in the field. So, so yeah, that's the garden plot. Um, we don't really do much of a rotation in here. We don't. It's cover crop, that's about <laughs> it. So no, no crop rotation for the lettuce plot. Um, 
So then this area, we've got what we showed as field one on the map. Um, field one currently was in cover crop all winter. It has now been chopped down the flail more. I've gone through and subsoiled the field and then rototilled all of the residue in. Um, I don't have a set of discs and I know rototilling isn't the best for the soil, but it's what I have for the time being, so we're making use of it. Um, this will then get, um, I might borrow a set of discs. I want to give this some time so that, again, we can try to deplete some of the weed seed bank that is in here. And then I'll be putting another cover crop in, which will be different than fall rye. Fall rye is a good overwinter, cool weather crop that goes to seed around this time of the year, um, is when it's almost done. I'll be putting in a sorghum Sudan cover crop, which should grow six to 10 feet high. And it's a massive biomass producer. So I think it's 16 to 18,000 pounds of biomass per acre. So it's quite a pile. And what I'm looking for is not only the above ground growth, now that I've subsoiled it and, and churned it all in, I want the roots to go down deep and get down into the cracks that I've created and keep the soil alive so that we can stop rotivating and then start having cover crop upon cover crop to build nutrition. Um, the chickens were in here for, oh, I don't know, they are probably here for a month and a half or so before we just moved them to the orchard. Um, and so they do a pretty good job of eating a bunch of the stuff, but we only have 100 chickens and I think you'd probably need to have like 500 for it to be more effective. When you, and then you got to contain them to a smaller area. So when I say 500, I'm saying that 500 chickens for us having a three quarter acre plot would be more effective at chopping that three quarter acre plot up into six small areas. And then 500 chickens mow down a 40 by 120 foot area in a couple of weeks maybe, right. and then move them. So there's a whole nother kind of crop rotation. You're just doing it with livestock. Um, so that's the plan for this year with the hopes of growing food in this plot next year. So it's all the pre-planning. Um, this year we're producing food in plot two, field two, I should say. And we've been producing food in field two for three years now. Um, so this field needs a rest. Even though we're, we're utilizing a crop rotation, um, this field needs to be reworked with the subsoiler and needs to have a really good cover crop put in there. And then we'll eventually be moving to field three. So field three won't produce food for a cash crop, say for us for, so one, two, three, so four more seasons from now. We're growing food this year here, next year, the year after, and then we'll go to the new area, which will give us three full seasons of growing cover crops and flattening it and planting through it or churning some of it in maybe the first year or so. Um, so we'll continue to rototill it, but then we'll stop doing that and then just grow and basically recycle the nutrients, keep bringing them from down below, mm -hmm. capturing carbon and shove it back on the surface of the ground and just keep that going until I think what a lot of people do, including we did at the beginning is we're just take, 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 and we never put either enough back. Some people don't put any back. And I think the better solution is take and then put back a whole bunch and then take a little bit again. And I think life will become a little bit more easy on the farm if we do that. Um, yeah. And then we have a flower plot, which is new this year. Um, that's kind of Cindy's little baby, but Aside from it being pretty uh, and providing the farm with some additional revenue, right, through uh, bouquets and stuff like that and sales to the farm stand, there'll be a huge benefit to having um, insects that we want, beneficial insects, being able to feed on and capture nectar from the flowers, which then gives them the energy to go and hunt for their food sources, which are, for the most part, end up being pests of farms. Um, I'm sure there's some that have a Jekyll and Hyde, but I haven't figured that one out yet either. Um, never ending growth. Oh, yeah.
this is an example of these four beds will be getting planted for carrots next week. So we amended them and prepared them a month ago. And then we had a tarp jug over it and uh, all sandbagged down. And the goal behind that was to have the black side of the tarp up to increase as much of the right temperature and moisture and humidity to get as many seeds in the soil to germinate and grow, but with no light. So they grow out of the soil and they grow and grow and grow until they die. They've expended all their energy and they can't get energy unless they get light to photosynthesize. So we've done a pile of it. And actually, if we look over, you see all the other stuff that's there. It's all died back from being under the tarp. So that would now become organic matter that will feed the microorganisms for the rest of the season, or some of it will become food. And uh, we've now gone over this with the BCS, and that gives it another week to germinate more seeds that may be in there that we don't know exist or haven't um, popped up yet. And uh, so there's white, white thread Oh, there's a little, I don't know what that is, critter of some sort. These white, white thread stage. So those are really, really easy to kill. Um, my guess is that that is probably a lady's thumb, which is this plant here. And they're very prolific and they produce weeds super fast. But when those, if, if those are under the tarp, when we lift the tarp off, the sunlight would almost kill some of them, or just a light disturbance, and or the flame weeder. We walk over the flame weeder real quick. That extra heat just cooks those things and they're done. Um, so that's been a huge plus for us to have that. Um, and then, so that's four plantings of carrots. There's four more here that have gone in. And there's another four that have gone in here. So this is, the 120 foot rows, we're doing four plantings or four rows at a time uh, with those three small 40 foot rows just being an early trial. Um, and we'll see how they get on. So these ones are, they're not too big. They're only a couple, two to three inches high right now. And Spinach rows, again, we've been all winter long. We started doing two at a time. Um, when we did the two plantings, we planted one on six runs and one on four runs. And so what that means is on this row that run that goes, this row is 120 feet long, one run of seed um, with our little seeding machine we ran six passes on this row and we did four on that one and those were planted at the same time and we had done that four times this spring before getting to this row with the goal of being what do we want to stick with do we want to stick with six row runs or four runs oh good point yeah there's some toss-ups like weeding we can weed a four run row a lot easier than we can six because there's more space but are we getting the the revenue from that row does it make it worthwhile in terms of overall revenue to do it because we don't spend a lot of time weeding spinach once the year gets going we only plant it and then the whole thing gets flail mored and tilled in after one planting so that we can keep a, a succession planting going of having the same size of yummy spinach and not letting it grow old and tall yeah. and gross so it, you know so all these rows here are dedicated to a succession of spinach um, every week and so there was a bit of a mix-up on these two rows as to which one would get planted at next but this is the oldest one then that one then this one and that one just got planted this week next week the next one the week after that within about two weeks those two rows will be um, expired they'll have been growing too long the leaves start to get pointy and they're starting to try to bolt and go to seed. And in two weeks, we'll be harvesting from this one. So we've got a little bit of weeding to do in here, um, but that'll be pretty fast to deal with what's left there. 
and then beats. Again, we're playing with the four runs per row and three runs per row to see what one we like better. Um, we've always struggled with beets to grow them. And Cindy and I have both looked at this a few times and, it, and we have to tip our hat to ourselves that this is like probably one of our best starts to the season growing beets. Yeah. We've never had beets that look even and beautiful green all the way through. They look great. Wow. And then little, there's little things, right? Like, so because Swiss chard goes in, it's in until Christmas time, um, where all the rest of them don't. They're, they're direct seeded crops that are going to be getting turned in all the time. Swiss chard isn't in the brassica family, but it needs to be tarped or ground cover and drip tape. So we always put the Swiss chard next to the kale because they go in the ground at the same time and they're in the ground for the same length of time. So we can hook it up on the watering system and then we know that part of our crop rotation the Swiss chard is part of the goose foot that's what we call it um, these are always going to be beside each other so when this moves the Swiss chard is always going to be beside the kale so that we can tag it in on the watering just otherwise we have an isolated row that is we either have a long strand of drip tape which gets in the way in the tractor or people trip on it or whatever or we've got to have an additional schedule drawn out as to when does that one get watered. This way we can just lump it in with all the brassicas. Yeah, brassicas we do every, I don't know what this, the schedule is for this actually. In the winter it starts out like four to five weeks in between plantings and then the season gets going because the soil temperature is getting warmer and more hours of daylight and more photosynthesizing, the gap gets smaller and smaller in between transplants going into the ground. So two of them were put in early in the year. All of our broccoli and uh, this is a bit of kohlrabi with cabbage and cauliflower. So we do those two rows at the same planting. Off topic, see all these white butterflies? Yeah. These are what lay the little green worm on the brassicas. Oh. They're like little silkworms. And they literally, they fly up, they land, and they leave that quickly, and they've deposited an egg on the leaf. Yeah, so every time you see them touch down, they're potentially laying an egg on here. Now, it's not that detrimental to us. You see that there's a little bit of bug bites, and sometimes they're on the leaves. Um, there's other problems that we would have, say, um, over and above those. I tried running around one time with a butterfly net and catching them, and I think I did pretty good, but I think the crew enjoyed watching me do it more than anything else. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we do the two plantings each week. Uh, we ended up running out of ground cover, um, which I'm referring to as this black stuff. And I honestly, I, it works. I don't like it. I'd rather eliminate it from the whole program if we could. One, it's plastic. Two, you got to burn the holes in, in it, um, so you're creating more waste. And it doesn't last forever. So at some point, we're going to have to start redoing these, which is just an additional cost. And I sometimes wonder about just having mechanically um, weeded beds or, or something set up a little differently. But um, these next three beds, we're going to be tracking the difference of how much time we actually have to put into them for weeding these things mm. to see... What's the cost difference? Really, is it better to just weed it? Or does it make sense to stick with using ground cover and, and all the drip tape? And then the other thing that happens, so for anyone that wants to do drip tape down the road, when you put your watering system together and you turn it on, you gotta come back and check and make sure that there's no leaks. And you have to do that every time you turn it on. So Whoa. for this system, this the brassica, this one zone, um, so we've got a watering schedule and all the farm is divided up into different zones so that we know what we're going to do in the daytime and what we're going to do at nighttime. Um, because at this time of the year now, we will be watering almost 24 hours a day of some sort of irrigation, just so that we have the capacity to water everything that needs it. Um, and we're only on 10 gallons per minute, so that's why. If we come down at nighttime and turn one of these on, and we don't come back in half an hour to check, and we've blown an end off, 
none of the row is getting watered, right. but all the water is pumping out the end that blew off and we'll water that all night long and then get up in the morning and realize we've just dumped an all, all night worth of water at 10 gallons per minute or at eight out of a garden hose and have accomplished nothing. And we're actually now behind on our schedule because our schedule is set for zones per day. And if we miss it, then it changes our whole schedule. Yeah, kind of hard to catch up on something like that. Yeah, especially when it needs it. Um, it becomes hard when the plants are like needing the water now. Right. It's like, well, I, we can only water some today and I guess then some later and some tomorrow and you try to catch up. But um, these are, we've combined our nutrient dense, which is all of our mustards and our arugula together into one planting. Um, it's divided up so that it's not all mixed, but we'll do arugula and we'll do nutrient dense. And then um, we'll have multiple beds for keeping that succession going all the time. Um, so for that, we've got six plots. We do 60 feet every week. And that six bed um, plot gives us enough that we can have a continual supply that has to be planted every week. And then radishes. There's three beds here where we grow our radishes. This isn't producing any radishes. And so as an example, if you want to not have any radishes, let ladies thumb take over. <laughs> um, it was a really poor germination. Uh, we're not sure if the seed was different or if uh, something on the cedar didn't work the way we wanted and we didn't flame weed the bed so by not establishing that bed and flame weeding it a week prior um, or flame weeding it the day we plant that's what's happened with weeds and the lady's thumb all of this will out compete the radish and some of the reading i've just been doing is indicating that um, lady's thumb is also Allelopathic. It's that word I keep trying to throw down. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. But it has, and th that's what I was trying to find out. Does it have the ability to put some sort of chemical compound or toxin into the ground to inhibit the growth of competition? Right, yeah. And I think it does. Other people seem to think it does. <clears throat> I think it does. So I'm going with the fact that it has that ability. But it can be dealt with really easily if you don't let it go to seed. And if you um, take the steps to prevent it from establishing in the bed, which we didn't do in this 40 feet. So this 40 feet is a write-off. There won't be any radishes coming out of there. Um, and then green onions. We were talking about trying to do successions with green onions. I'm not sure how that's going to work, but this will be a good year to trial it and practice and see what's happening. And then... Um, I'm honestly not sure. There's some sort of onion, I guess, or shallot, and more onions or shallots. I'm not sure which one's which here. And then, so we're all the way down to F6 in field two. And this is supposed to just be the aliums. So normally garlic would be in here too. But because we already had garlic growing, because garlic has to be planted in September, the end of September, and then harvested usually around the uh, beginning of July maybe, um, that was already going and planted. And this sixth plot of field two didn't exist last fall. So we just prepared this one this winter, and we've been adding amendment and compost, and it's still a rock garden, but it has a long ways to go. But it'll still be good. So... We've decided to plant potatoes in here. Potatoes are a good crop to put in if you're trying to build soil. They put a lot of root fiber. Even though you're only harvesting the actual starchy potato, yeah. there's a whole lot of other biomass gets created from it. And they don't like being in really rich soil anyways. So they'll, oh. they, they'll do well in rich soil, but they definitely don't want to have a high pH. So we haven't added any agricultural lime to those rows, which the ground up limestone would essentially bring our pH up from probably a 5 or 5.3 or 5.2 or something that it is here closer to the the industry standard of six five for all growing i'm sure the guys that are doing big acreages they're not concerned about six five they're concerned about 
what does this crop want and make it happen. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the potatoes, we put them in, I think about every foot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically all the potatoes that we were sitting in the walk-in cooler that we were eating from, and then they just eventually start to grow eyes. So they become seed potato, and we just fired them all in here. And we didn't cut them in half. I mean, we probably had potatoes like that in here with eyes growing out of it. We just buried the whole thing. But we had enough right. that we could do it. If you had one potato and it had 10 eyes, you could probably cut that into 10 pieces and have a potato for each one. Will you have as big a plant? I don't really know. I kind of think that because the potato ends up becoming the energy right. source for the plant to send up and send roots down. Super poor soil, I don't know, big potato would maybe give us a better head start at it. And I, so far they look great. Oh, yeah. um, so when you mound them up here, how high do you mound them? There? Is that, that you just keep it? going. I don't oh, know if do. there's a magic number. These need to be mounded again. They're getting too tall. Uh, again, it's another thing I'm trying to build for the tractor so we can just walk the tractor over top of the crow with you know, the row with two discs and just throw dirt against it. But what they've been doing is just hand raking it, um, which deals with some of the weeds anyways when they do it. Um, but, and then the other thing we got told about, which we did, I think we did it last year and it, and it finally worked. We had some complications that out of our hands we couldn't do, but potatoes are part of the nightshade family and they'll get a, a blight. And so if you get blight on the plant, that's a fungus that infects the plant and then it goes down, I guess, systemically and will infect the tuber. And now I don't know if it'll affect its storage. I'm sure it probably does. So the likelihood of it making it all the way to the next spring is probably pretty low. And if it does make it all the way through, you're now planting a plant that already has a higher probability of getting blight, I think. So what we've done, and this was another um, older, almost retired farmer that had told us this, once they get to the right stage, which is all the flowers, and you get almost like little seeds being produced, the, the little seed starting on a plant is an indication that it's, it's only grown as big as it can go. Now it's going to go into reproductive mode. So you're going to start to, if you let all the seeds continue to grow, it's sucking the energy from its storage, which is the potato. Oh, right. So you cut all the tops off and prevent that thing from doing anything else. It now shuts down, and then the potato... The potato tuber cures in the soil with yeah. zero light, so it won't turn green. Nice. You don't want to water it though, so you got to make sure you're not adding water or you'll end up rotting them. But now you don't have to go and harvest all the potatoes and then put them somewhere to dry out of the light. You're, you're minimizing work. Right. You just leave them in the ground for three weeks or a month, or you can leave them in there all winter if you wanted to put straw on it, and it's not in an area that's going to have a high water table. And oh, when you yeah, want potatoes, just go dig them out, and you'll have them there all year. Oh, nice. We wouldn't do it because, one, we want to have the area into a crop rotation so we can build soil for ourselves. And, like I was showing you with the carrots, we got a high wireworm problem. Right. Wireworms love potatoes. So even though this crop looks awesome, when we get these out of the ground, these aren't necessarily something we've been selling as a, as a revenue stream for the farm. Um, because they will have wireworm marks all through them. And those won't last. You know, you, a little nick out of the potato, that's the first place you're going to get a disease of either fungal or bacteria or something to break the potato down. So you get what you get. Um, and then this is the new plot, which we're calling F3. And so we've put a fair bit of effort into this area that has the irrigation on it right now, and that's already been seeded with oats. With the goal being, once the oats germinate and get up to about probably six to eight inches high, we'll start bringing the chickens over and bring them out of the orchard and set them up here. And this they'll get a 40 by 60 foot plot for a few weeks, and then we'll move them, and they'll get the other 60 by 40 foot. And then this whole area is gonna be succession planted all the way around so that we can continue to move them. The goal is to not let them eat the place down so that they've killed everything. Right. Mow it down and then move them. Mow it down, move them. Right. Now we're saving money on seed because the seed will regrow and it's got added fertility from the chicken poop there oh, right, to yeah. feed the microbes and get a little bit more jam going. Um, but we've still got areas we've got a stone pick and 
you know, like woody debris and organic matter can be good. Um, it will eventually break down. We're still picking a lot of it up, get it out of there because we're still mechanically tilling the soil, either cultivating it and eventually we'll till it to eliminate the seed bank that already exists in there. Um, and we'll continually find rocks and pieces of wood and get them out. Once we get it conditioned the way we want, then we'll go to just cover crop and get back into the recycling mode and hope that in three growing seasons we've spent enough time and energy to build soil up to where we can then take that little bit from the soil for our cash crop without damaging the nutrient reserve that we've been working three years at building. And then, you know, in that time frame when we're down here, these other fields will all get two years of cover crop with one of them will have an animal rotation in there. Be it chickens or maybe sheep one day or something too, I don't know. Oh, nice. Well. <laughs> That's the end of my story. <laughs> Ha, <laughs>